Good evening. <laughs> Goodbye Forever, Volume 2 by Nak Chang Lum Shi. Chapter 5, Part 1. Chapter 5, If It's a Matter of Religion. I packed my Nakpa robes. I'd had them since Nepal in 1971. Kyabje Dujam Rinpoche Jigdral had instructed me to have them made and wearing them always made me feel a closeness of connection with him. Robes notwithstanding, I hadn't become stereotypical. That proved problematic on occasion when I, wet, when I met Western-born Tibetan Buddhists, if they turned out to be stereotypical. This was a phenomenon I recognised almost immediately. To be fair, they probably recognised me just as quickly as someone who didn't fit. It must be similar to the way in which one can tell if someone is not of one's own nationality. No matter how fluent linguistically such a person might be, there are always telltale signs of otherness. I must have come across like Eliza Doolittle. I knew the technical vocabulary, but I never adopted the mean. Mine was a peculiar mean, neither culturally Tibetan nor English. It was something else, but whatever it was, it was not the mean of the convert. I obviously was a convert. I'd converted at junior school. But maybe I'd been a convert so long that I no longer acted like a convert. I didn't wear a tengar like a necklace. I didn't wear a Nehru jacket, Manali hat or Kulu shawl. I hadn't taken to saying Acha for OK. I never said OK in any case as all right, fine, Certainly, surely, indubitably, positively, absolutely, definitely, or completely seem to cover all eventualities. Be that as it may, I just had no desire to judge or be judged. I certainly made judgments, but I kept them to myself. Being a Buddhist occasionally proved problematic with people who were antithetical to Eastern religions. Why would you want to follow an Eastern religion rather than that of your own country? To which I'd reply, I thought Christianity came from the Middle East. If I wanted to follow the indigenous religion, it would be difficult because it's more or less lost. That response invariably roused people's ire, so I decided it was better to say, I have great respect for Christ, but I never found as good an exemplar of his religion as I found in Dujum Rinpoche. I found an exemplar, and so I follow my exemplar's religion. Had I found a Christian exemplar, I would probably be a Christian. That reply seemed mostly to work in terminating any possible argument, but there were always some who had something else to say. Then I would have to explain that I did not enjoy discussing religion. It sometimes felt somewhat isolated to be viewed with suspicion from two quarters. I was neither one thing nor another. I'd naturally told Det about being a non-celibate tantric priest not long after we began our relationship. I'd had to endure her being faintly amused by the idea. She wanted me to dress up for her inspection. I'd almost refused. Fortunately, I caught myself being the kind of person I don't appreciate and changed into the maroon waistcoat, 
white ankle length widely pleated skirt and red shawl with a white panel down the middle. To Dette's credit, she didn't titter or make one of her customary Dorothy Parker style remarks. Well, I can see that you know how to wear these garments and I can see that they're not at all the run-of-the-mill Harry Krishna get-up. But it's as if I'm no longer looking at Vic. You look so removed from my world. It's as if I don't really know how to talk to you. I removed them and suddenly we were in the usual situation in which clothes are absent. Some time later I felt I needed to normalise the situation and said, I hope this isn't going to develop into a fetish with you, Det. Good God, no. I've seen you wear your vestments once and once is enough. You can tuck them away now and bring them out when you go to that place in Scotland. You know that religion's not really my thing, unless it's Norse or Celtic. Yes, that's why I don't often say anything. Oh, I don't mind from time to time when it's pertinent to our conversation and not too concerned with my loving everyone more than I've inclined to do. Fine with me, Det, I laughed. You're making a fine job of being more like Dorothy Parker than Dorothy Parker. But I don't think you're actually as cynical as you like to appear. That caused Det to harumph slightly. I knew that harumph and knew that she felt unmasked whenever she made that sound. Maybe, she responded. But that will have to remain a subject of mystery, if you don't mind. Not a bit. Mystery is one of your charming characteristics. And there we left the subject. It merged with the dusk as the sun dipped far enough below the horizon of houses to flood our eyes with night. The robes were never mentioned again with debt nor the Vajrayana vows that went with them, apart from the hair vows and the vows concerning other gender appreciation and respect. This vow concerns never deriding women. The same vow applies to women in respect of men. The natural extrapolations of this vow open out into the possibility of romance as a Vajrayana practice, in which men and women in relationship commit to that view. I explained this to Det later in the year because she had inquired, but she told me she didn't feel any need to bind herself to artificial religious constraints. If a person is worthy of respect, then I'll give respect. And if a person proves worthy of trust, I'll be trusting. But I'll never offer either just to obey a rule. That just sounds like those awful wedding vows to love, honour and obey. I don't think those vows are so bad if both partners love, honour and obey. In terms of Vajrayana, however, it's simply the pragmatic extrapolation of a natural phenomenon. When two people are in love, it's quite natural to be open and kind, trusting and respectful, without any artificiality being involved. All a couple has to do is to continue in courtship mode. But what if you have ideas I don't respect? Why should I feel obliged to respect that? Well, you might feel regretful about the lack of respect. Maybe, but what would be the point? 
the point? I really had no idea how to answer that without saying that I wouldn't feel happy in relationship where mutual trust and respect were not the basis. The point is that I prefer the atmosphere of romance to the atmosphere where romance appears to be in decline and lack of respect seems in decline. You could see it like that, or you could see it as a more mature form of relationship in which respect had to be earned. Yes, I'm not saying that respect shouldn't be earned, but respect is there in the romance when it first appears. All right then, but that's all a bit unreal, isn't it? And after a while, you just have to be realistic. Well, Det, I suppose that you're naturally more cynical than I am, and I respect your cynicism in many cases, especially in respect of what I might term the air-headedness of much of the counterculture. So, you see, respect can be earned. Indeed, it can, I replied. But Det never volunteered a comment on what she respected in relation to me. And I didn't ask. Maybe it simply slipped her mind, or maybe she found my penchant for the reciprocation of respect a little twee. It was strange to find that I could be regarded as cutesy. It wasn't how I saw myself. I thought I was reasonably lacking in mawkishness. Maybe I was wrong, but I saw nothing excessively saccharine in romance as I saw it. It sometimes struck me that Det and I operated somewhat in reverse in terms of customary gender orientation. In certain respects, a feisty lady was exactly what I wanted, but maybe without the tendency to lose tenderness after romantic conquest. That is what seemed to have happened. Debt seemed to have hardened in some way that was not fabulously endearing. At this point, I realised that I had been uneasy for a while, in terms of what a Nakpa was doing in such a situation. Nepal and Dujam Rimshe seemed somehow more distant when I was with Debt. At first, I thought it was entirely my fault and that I should be able to integrate my sense of Dujan Rimshe with every situation. As time passed, however, I realised that it was entirely my fault for being in relationship with someone who was entirely closed in terms of Vajrayana. I would have liked to have talked with Det about how wonderful I found these Vajrayana ideas in terms of what it could mean to society. This was an idea that, although fundamentally esoteric, was brilliantly pragmatic. Why did men and women seek each other out as romantic partners whilst disrespecting each other? It was ludicrous. It was set up to create dissatisfaction, if not misery. I often wondered what society would be like if men and women genuinely admired and respected each other. The subject came up early in 1974 with Penelope, Merrill and Rebecca. They thought it a remarkable aspect of Vajrayana. It's interesting, you know, that you've had this idea in your mind for the year you've lived with us without our knowing about it, Penelope mused, because it's now kind of obvious that we've all been influenced by it. Merrill nodded. I suppose we must have taken it on board subconsciously. I mean, maybe it's the way you've never made tedious 
women driver remarks or anything else like that. I did think at first that it might have been because you were outnumbered or something, but it was so obviously not like that. I think, Merrill smiled, that the fact that you never speak like that has sort of inhibited me, at least, from making the typical comments that women make about men. I mean, I have made that kind of comment from time to time, but mainly in retaliation. I can see what a bore that is, because it's just so unnecessary. Yeah, really, I'd say the same, Rebecca infused. It's so strange though, isn't it? I mean, how that works. But then you're hardly the average kind of man anyway. No, I'm not, I sighed. That's certainly true. I'm not the average kind of anything, which can often be irritating to other people. It irritates the hell out of Todd and Veranda that I'm neither fish nor fowl, nor good red herring. But I wouldn't be any other way, unless it would be being better at what I try to do. You know, I have to say this, I feel normal here in this house. Most other places, I tend to feel like the geek or something. Geek, inquired Penelope. Yeah, you know, from Ballad of a Thin Man, the Dylan song. Then I sang. You're handing your ticket to go see the geek who walks up to you when he hears you speak. And he says, how does it feel to be such a freak? And you say, impossible as he hands you a bone and something is happening here but you don't know what it is do you mr jones something like that and it really feels like that merrill asked with a slightly sad variant of a frown no not quite like that I'm neither at the circus as one of the crowd, nor in the cage. The only thing I can say is that I'm where I put myself, and it ain't nobody's fault but mine. Then I sang. I got a bottle in a hole. I got a bottle in a hole. If I die and my soul belong, ain't nobody's fault but mine. Nobody's fault but mine. Nobody's fault but mine. If I die and my soul belong, Ain't nobody's fault but mine. You've got a song for every occasion, Vic, Rebecca laughed. Yes, more or less. I see it as a bluesman's role somehow. Blues is some sort of running social commentary that makes emotional sense of the circus of existence. Speaking of circus, I still haven't got a clear idea of what the geek is, asked Penelope. Ah, the geek is, I paused to consider what I was going to say. The geek's a tragic character, an alcoholic in some advanced state of physical deterioration upon whom the circus seizes. They make a deal whereby they supply all the whiskey the geek can drink in return for his or her being in a cage every night, wearing a scrap of rag as a loincloth. The geek would simply have to roar and bellow occasionally and they'd advertise the missing link. 
you know, the stage of evolution between anthropoids and Homo sapiens. They'd sometimes be encouraged to bite the heads off chickens or snakes. They usually didn't live long as they'd die of alcoholic poisoning and that was supposed to be their own responsibility. It's a sad story. People were fairly brutal back in the earlier part of the century and before. I think they still are, really, Penelope sighed. I don't think it takes much for people to degenerate to that level. Yes, I sighed. I think you're right. You only have to think of Nazi Germany. Exactly, said Rebecca. Sorry about that, I offered. I didn't mean to put a crimp in the evening. No, not at all. We have to be able to look at these things. A lot of people don't, though, and I think that's what makes them as hard-hearted and narrow-minded as they are. That's true, Penelope sighed. You have to pay the price for an awareness of reality. And part of that is the way so many relationships seem to go. You know, where men and women live as connubial enemies. Yes, that is horrible to see and horrible to be around. The idea with Vajrayana is that men and women have to maintain what occurs in courtship. That is to say, they have to be open-minded and kindly before all else. The problem is that although this happens at the start of a romance, it tends to dilute over time. Eventually, of course, the romance degenerates and finally disappears. The idea with Vajrayana is that this needn't happen. If you maintain courtship behaviour, the romance never has to end. It takes two, though, this statement had slipped from Rebecca's mouth before she realised it and the room went silent. I knew exactly what she was thinking. The girls knew what Rebecca was thinking. They knew that I knew as well. The girls had observed how debt could be with me from time to time. I sat there not knowing what to say. Rebecca was right, of course. It did take two. Det had decided the Vajrayana approach was artificial. She'd told me that she'd rather not take an artificial mode of being, whether they were good for Buddhists or otherwise. So that left me on my own with my approach to what romance ought to be. Eventually I replied, yes, it does. It takes two. The ladies looked highly embarrassed and Rebecca said, I apologise, Vic. I'm so sorry. I shouldn't have said what I said. I'm not such a delicate flower, I laughed, but the laugh was forced. I laughed merely to put them all at their ease. And there's nothing for which you need to apologise. I wouldn't like to think you had to pussyfoot around me or anything. There are plenty of times in life when things aren't exactly straightforward and it would be a shame if friends couldn't be open and discuss, discuss whatever presented itself. Absolutely, Vic. Now, how about opening a bottle of wine and drinking a toast to the best outcome for us all? A bottle of rather nice claret presented itself to me last week and we haven't touched a drop yet. Fine notion. I have a bottle of Barolo tucked away. Allow me to hoik it out and we can move from one to the other. The Barolo's quite heavy. I felt relieved that the subject could be changed and that I wouldn't feel obliged to explain that my relationship with debt was in question with respect to my religious views on how relationships should be. There was so much avoidance with debt. 
I'd felt no pressing need to be too specific about my time in India and Nepal back in 71. That was something I kept hidden from most people, mainly because I preferred to avoid questions. I don't mind questions if they arise from serious interest, but I revolted against court casual curiosity. I also wasn't keen on questions that turned into arguments or discussions in which I was edged into the position of apologist. Someone once asked, what's Tibetan Buddhism got to offer the world anyway? And I replied, your guess is as good as mine. I purloined that response from Chögyam Trumpa Rinpoche. He gave it in answer to an impertinent question and I liked the mild humour of it. Anyway, anyone who tags anyway to the end of a question is unlikely to be asking a serious question. It's more of a challenge. And my preference when challenged in such a way is to cause the question to evaporate into its own vapidity. To another impertinent question, Chugyam Trumpa Rinpoche replied, quite frankly, fuck you, sir. I never purloined that answer, not because I felt any disapproval for the response. It was simply that it wasn't my style. Besides which, it's not wise to ape one's betters. I discovered that the subject of religion makes some people quite belligerent. It makes others pretentious, self-righteous, querulous, sanctimonious, hypercritical, censorious, supercilious, condescending, contemptuous and self-obsessed. Not that I entirely lack those propensities, but I prefer to live and let live. I tend to feel that my opinions are merely opinions. Opinions are subjective and therefore I see no reason to make bludgeons out of them. Why would I wish to demand conformity of others? <laughs>